that you're here with us today. And uh, we're here to worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so uh, let's stand together this morning as we sing a song that talks about the fact that Jesus saves. Let's have a word of prayer for uh, giving it to worship today. Father in heaven, we give you praise. We give you thanks that you indeed are the one who saves. We were dead in our sin. But you had favor. You came to this earth. You died on the cross so that we could have life and forgiveness of sins. And we say thank you. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that our worship today would just be a fragrant offering to you. Yes. Lifted up to the heavens from uh, hearts and minds that are in love with Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together.
example. What great songs reminding us of the power of Christ in our lives. We're not left alone. The power of hell, no scheme of man, can never pluck me from his hand. We're secure. He promised he will never leave us or forsake us. Man, the, the joy that, I, I mean, I, I just know for myself singing these songs. Resting in the truth of, of, of God's word, literally, uh, uh, that we're singing today. So uh, I pray that, uh, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, that even as even as we sing these things. And, uh, and I know in our church in the last week, uh, there's been a number of us who have uh, contracted the, the coronavirus, and including myself and my family. So we greatly appreciate your prayers and concern for us. Uh, and just the, the blessing that all of you have been to us and the number of people we've had offering to bring us groceries. It's like, no, no, we, we have plenty of groceries now. We've <laughs> stocked up several times here. So, but we appreciate just the, the outpouring of love. And uh, I got off of my quarantine uh, beginning Friday morning, and, uh, and, and Anne is off quarantine as well. The kids will go in stages for the coming week here depending on when they uh, got coronavirus or didn't get coronavirus. But we're all doing well, we're all healthy, we're all feeling great, and uh, if you come over, came over to our place, you would not have any idea that anybody had ever been sick. Um, so uh, it's good, praise God. Um, on the other hand, as we talked about Lauren uh, Creasel and Beth Creasel, having a very different go of it, and, uh, and struggling through some things. So uh, by the grace of God, we give him, we give him praise. That it, in a lot of places, it's really not that bad, but at the same time, we want to take everything with caution and care and concern from others, because for some of our loved ones and family, it, it is a significant issue for them, and uh, and we really want to continue to pray and lift them up. Um, so, But thank you so much for your prayers. If you're visiting with us today, we just uh, welcome you and, uh, and hope that you are blessed. We invite you on the table in the back uh, by the media booth there is a, is a card that says welcome. And you can just uh, put your whatever information that, that you think we need to connect with you and be able to help you get connected and plugged into places of ministry in our church. Uh, we invite you to do that and then drop that in the receptacle on that table. There's also a card for our prayer requests. And, and like I just said, we are so grateful for your prayers for our family in the last couple of weeks. Um, but we also want to be praying for one another and lifting each other up. And so we invite you and encourage you to, to grab one of those and uh, uh, fill out whatever prayer request you have need of right now. Um, <clears throat> there's also in that receptacle place that you can drop your tithes and offerings and all those things as well. Um, and we continue to, to support God's church and the work that he is doing through our gifts and, and our offerings. So let's take a moment to pray here this morning. Father, we just give you thanks uh, for your goodness, for your graciousness and kindness. God, we th I, just, I personally thank you for your healing touch, for, uh, for your grace and mercy on, on my family. Lord, we continue to lift up Lauren Creasel. We just pray your healing over him. We, uh, we, we, we pray, Jesus, that, uh, that your healing power strengthen his body to overcome this sickness and disease. God, we pray for your grace and your mercy on them, and just that you would touch them. Father, we pray that you would take these gifts and offerings today and use them for your glory, Jesus. That people around the world and around our community would recognize you as Lord and Savior due to the faithfulness and, and obedience of your people giving to your, your kingdom, Jesus. We just trust you with these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of announcements that I have for us this morning, and obviously being out on quarantine, it's not on video today, um, but uh, next Sunday uh, from 2 to 4 is Trunk or Treat, and so invite all of you to come and to bring friends and family to that. Uh, it's going to be a little different. Amy McMartin has, is heading that up, so I encourage you to, to talk to her if you have questions. All of her information is in the newsletter. I was told if you are planning on bringing candy, King Supers is all their candy, half price for the next few days, so that might be a good time to stock up for the church and for trunk or treat. So come out and have a great time with that next Sunday afternoon, uh, bringing your kids for that. Also, Operation Christmas Child, it's only October, but we are in full speed ahead uh, for Operation Christmas Child. All the information is out on the table in the foyer, and uh, we encourage you to grab your boxes there, uh, grab all the information.
information there that you need and get those boxes filled and back to the church by November 15th is the deadline for that. So those are the only two announcements that I have, but uh, Pastor Taylor has some things he wants to share as well. Um, you know, I've had a word go through my mind this last week, and the word is perseverance. Perseverance. Um, as you guys know, that these COVID numbers have really shot up here in, in southeastern Wyoming, and you know, numbers are way down across the board here at the church, and, and it's all okay. Uh, the YouTube channel's up; it's being utilized. People can come or not come for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and all of that's okay. Some people sit downstairs, wear masks the entire time, they're more spread out. Some people are up here wearing masks, some without. It's okay, but we need to persevere. We need to persevere. This has been dragging on a long time. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to get a little bit of COVID fatigue, right? Because everything's just so different. It's just so... Um, Difficult. I mean, even talking to the students that are in the public schools and the way things have to be, and some online and some not, and some of us know people who've gotten sick, some of us know people who've gotten really sick, and, and everything in between. And we come to church and there's not anywhere near as many people. We have to continue to persevere. Christ is in control. He is still on the throne and he is sovereign over everything. And we just continue in hope and faith and victory in him. And so I just want to give you a word of encouragement. No matter where you're at, spiritually, emotionally, physically, through all these different things, continue to trust in the Lord and persevere. Perseverance. Those who persevere to the end will be rewarded. And this is just a taste of what things may become as we, you know, get closer and closer for that trumpet to sound and the, and the Lord to descend. And I don't know about you guys, but man, oh man, I yearn for that day. I do. But the other thing I want to mention, too, because some people have been asking, and again, it's just in this area, this, this mindset of perseverance. You know, we've got all the drawings done. We've got um, over $600,000 raised towards building, and we're just trying to generate some, some extra income through selling that strip of land, and, and you know, there's all this interest, and then all of a sudden, bang, everything just sort of just shut down, and we haven't had any offers. Just continue to pray. Amen. It's all in the Lord's time, Amen. and we will persevere. And just continue to move forward in faith and hope and victory of everything that God has done, is doing, and one day will do. Right. And that's what sets us apart from other people. We have faith. We have hope. We have perseverance. And so I just want to encourage you, church, no matter where you're at, persevere. Continue to persevere in the hope of the Lord. Now we're going to sing a song that just, again, uh, set our hearts uh, on close as we're moving into God's word. The, the reality is this. Christ is risen. He is risen. And um, we walk in, in victory. We're no longer bound by sin and shame. We have Christ in us, as we talked about last year. The hope of glory. And if nothing else, that should give us all the reason we need to continue to persevere. And so we're going to sing a song that just focuses on the risen Christ. And you can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, you can raise your hands, you can pray. However you feel led this morning to just set yourself before the Lord of hosts, God Almighty, the risen Christ. Let's worship.
prison. Lord, we have life in you. We have hope in you. Our faith, our trust is in you. Holy Spirit, come this morning. Soften our hearts to hear your words. Speak to us. Guide us into all truth. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do. We just offer ourselves before gathered together in God's house. And again, for those that are having to watch online, uh, blessings to you. And, and we're going to get through this time. We are going to get through this time. And we'll just continue to persevere. I want to ask you a question this morning. Um, what, it is, what is it that we uh, really need to live? What do you need to live? You know, it's an interesting question. And uh, it may generate answers all across the board, depending on who you ask and what kind of setting I suppose some of the answer very uh, physiologically. In order to live, you need food, you need water, you need oxygen. That's true. If you deprive somebody of any of those items, they're not going to live for very long. Some people may answer philosophically or emotionally. In order to truly live, you need a purpose or, or you need to be loved or something along those lines. Ask a teenager and they may answer in order to live, you need internet access. <laughs> At least my kids may. And while I'm not going to argue with anybody today concerning the fact that we need food and we need water and we need oxygen in order to live, I just I want to set that aside for a moment and uh, focus on the question just a little more broadly. Let me ask it this way. What does a person need to truly live? I mean live life the way that it's intended to be lived. You know, I looked on the internet and I found some answers to that question this week. And there were some things that I had already mentioned, like you know, food and water and sleep and shelter. However, there were others like, you know, do what you love, eat healthy, smile more, and, and just you know, be yourself, to name a few things. This morning, as we continue our study through the book of Colossians, we're going to see that Christ alone is enough. Christ alone is enough. Aside from physiological needs like food and water and oxygen, which God provides for us anyway, Jesus is all you need to truly live. Jesus is all you need to truly live. In order to see this, I would like uh, you to follow along this morning as I read from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. That's our passage for today. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Beginning in verse 6, we read, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Father, we come before you with grateful hearts for Christ. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Son of God, the Savior, the risen Savior. And it's in Him that we live and move and have our being. And I pray, Lord, that as we explore this passage today, that we would truly see, just see deep inside of who we are, that Jesus is all that we need to truly live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you are a Christian, in other words, you believe in faith that Jesus is the
the Savior of the world, and you've accepted that grace that is so wonderfully given by God, then you have received Christ, and if you have received Christ, you need to walk in Him, Paul says. In other words, since Paul is assuming that um, is this true of the recipients of this letter to the Colossian church? And I'm assuming it's true for most all of us here today. He is saying, you have received Christ, now walk in him. That's what he's saying. You have received Christ, now walk in him. Walk in Christ. Now we see in the text the way in which we walk in Christ is that we are rooted and built up in him. What exactly does that mean? Well, when I think of rooted, plants and trees come to mind. Plants and trees that are well-rooted are firmly established. Have you ever tried to pull out a stump that was well-rooted? It's hard to do. I remember when we first moved to our house here in Cheyenne, there was this tree out in the front yard that just really wasn't doing very well. It was mostly dead. And so we cut it down. And uh, the tree, however, still must have had a good root system, I guess, because pulling that stump out was very difficult. We had to use a pretty heavy-duty truck with a substantial winch system, and, uh, and even at that, it was tough. It was a tough go, but we finally got that stump pulled out of the ground. Well-rooted trees and plants are hard to knock over. They're hard to pull out. When a believer is rooted in Christ, they can stand firm against the difficulties of life. They won't be easily knocked over. Rootedness in Christ gives us the ability to truly live. Also, just as plants draw nourishment from the soil through roots, so also believers draw strength from Christ. If you remember last week, we talked about how Christ lives in the believer. Because Jesus is fully God, and Jesus lives in the believer, we have everything we need to truly live life as we draw our spiritual nourishment from Christ. We don't need to turn to anywhere else. We see that we are also to be built up in Christ and established in the faith. Now that's the other thing that we see. Built up in Christ and established in the faith. Jesus is the firm foundation on which we build our lives. Now, if you were to build a structure, the first thing you need is a firm foundation. It does not do a whole lot of good to build a very nice-looking structure if there's nothing to hold it up. Christ is the firm foundation. We build our lives upon Him and Him alone if we want our lives to stand firm. Jesus touched on this concept at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. I just want to read that to you really, really quick. This is Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. And there we read this. Everyone, this is at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, he's done all this teaching, and then he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. The reality is, life is hard. And there will be difficult times. There will be storms that come against you. I think many of us are experiencing these things even right now and today. If, if you have built your life on Christ, you will stand firm, no matter what comes your way. However, if you built your life on anything other than Christ, you will not be able to withstand the storms when they come. Jesus is all you need to truly live. We are firmly rooted on the foundation of Christ and nothing else. And Paul, he fleshes this out further beginning in verse 8, when he talks about not being taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human traditions and the elemental spirits of the world, he says. The reality is this. We have everything we need in Jesus. 
We have everything that we need in Jesus. We do not need to turn to anything else to complete us spiritually, no matter how enticing it may appear. Remember, part of the reason Paul wrote to the Colossian church was to speak against some false teaching that had begun to permeate the church and to begin to pull people away from the foundational truths of Christ. The elemental forces, the elemental spiritual forces of this world are, are basic elements of, of religion or life philosophy that are undergirded by the father of lies and include anything that leads you to believe that you can do without God. For example, the world says that all people are inherently good. This is secular humanism at its core. All people are inherently good and that it's life experiences or societal systems that corrupt them. Change the system, and you will have a better outcome of the people. No. People are inherently sinful and totally depraved. And we need Jesus to change all people at the core of who they are. Now, perhaps you've heard the worldly wisdom that says marriage is all about making you happy. And if you are no longer happy, you're no longer being filled by the marriage. Well, then it's time to walk away and end the marriage. No. Marriage is about partnering with another person to serve the Lord and each other. And in so doing, you will be made more holy as you have things stripped out of your life that are not godly. Because marriage is very much a crucible which the Lord uses to refine us. Now, these are just two examples of worldly philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition and elemental forces, but I think you get the picture. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to teach us about the Lord so that we can know and dwell then in the truth. It's God's Word, empowered by the Holy Spirit, that that teaches us, it, it helps us dwell in those things that are true, that go against the elemental spirits and forces of the world. This is what keeps us rooted and built up in Christ. Dangerous teaching comes from picking and choosing what you consider to be true. All false teachers through the centuries have taken advantage of people who were not dwelling in the truth as portrayed in the scriptures and rather followed their heart and their feelings to determine what was true for them. I can tell you unequivocally that is a sure path to destruction. If you simply follow your heart to help you determine what is true for you, that is a path that goes over a very tall cliff. This is why we read in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Do not follow your heart. That is an empty, worldly philosophy. Follow the Lord and his word. Now, because of these worldly philosophies and teachings, people often seek to achieve then through their own self-effort that which they already have in Christ. Remember, Jesus is all you need to truly live. Do not, through your own self-effort, try to have everything that you already have in Christ. Do not do that. Because again, that will lead you down a bad path. Look out for number one. Everything you need for success is inherently in you. Just pull up your bootstraps, roll up your sleeves, and make things happen. These are not keys to success. Doing all things through Christ who gives you strength is what is needed. If, if we want to truly live life, then we need to walk in union with the indwelling Christ. And like we learned last week, Christ lives in you when you belong to him through salvation. Jesus is all you need to truly live. Amen. The world's philosophies and ways of doing things, it, it 
It's like a hollow chocolate Easter bunny. It looks good from the outside. You're like, man, this is going to be awesome. But once you bite into it, you are sorely disappointed. I can remember as a kid opening that up and then, oh, it's hollow. Why did you buy that, Mom? You guys know what I'm talking about. The world's way of doing things. The world's philosophies, the elemental spirits of the world, they will always disappoint you because the elemental spirits of the world are under the influence of Satan and they offer no hope. This world is difficult. I get it. And there are many things that come against us because it's a sinful and fallen world. I'm not going to deny that. There are some people going through some very, very difficult things, but no matter what it is that you are going through or that's going on around us, whether it's COVID-19 cases ratcheting up in, in Cheyenne or racial tensions across the country or the beauty of yet another contentious presidential election cycle or anything else the world may, may throw at us, we must continue to live in Christ. Jesus is all you need to truly live. The reason that this is all we need is because we have all we need because of the cross of Christ. It's the cross of Christ that gives us everything that we need. The cross of Christ has decisively defeated all demonic powers and dominions, and it provides the means of reconciliation for all who would believe. Listen again to verses 13 through 16 of our passage for today. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. When Jesus went to the cross, he paid the penalty for sin. And as we know, he did not stay dead. No, he rose again, and he lives, interceding for his children. When Jesus conquered death, we see in verse 15 that he disarmed all rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame. He shamed them with what he did. Even death and the grave could not hold Jesus. This is complete and total triumph, ultimate victory. And this is why we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gave us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in this that the cross covers it all. Even death cannot have a final say for a child of God. But just think about that for a minute. Even though our physical life will end on this earth one day, those who belong to Christ will not die. They will live forever with the Lord. Amen. Jesus is all you truly need to live. Now, one last point. Paul, he highlights circumcision in verse 11. And what in the world is he getting at with that discussion? Circumcision in the Old Testament was a physical mark that set Jewish males apart and it showed that they belonged to the Lord. Paul, he's making then a correlation that we, believers, male and female, are spiritually circumcised when we belong to Christ. We are spiritually circumcised when we belong to Christ. And it is a mark that sets the believer apart. So how, you may ask, has Jesus done this? What does that even mean? Well, the circumcision that is done by Jesus is a spiritual circumcision in, in the old nature, in that the old nature is removed, sort of cut off, if you would, put to death, and we are given a new heart that is renewed and filled with Christ. This goes back to some of what we talked about last week when we looked at the fact that Christ lives within the believer. And it's in this way, it's more a circumcision of the heart, if you would. But this is not a new concept. The Lord, he had talked about this even in the Old Testament. Listen to the following verses, Deuteronomy 10, 16. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. 
Or Jeremiah 4, 4, circumcised the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. And Paul, he picks up on this in Romans 2, 29, and he writes, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. What this is getting at is that when a person comes to Christ by grace through faith, the sin nature is stripped off and put to death. They are raised to life in Jesus then. He then takes up residence within the believer, like we discussed last week, and they now live an empowered life through the abiding presence of Jesus in them. And Paul, he spells this out in verse 12 when he talks about being buried in baptism, and raised through faith. With all of this sin, the believer is now free to live. Truly live. Before we believed in Christ, our nature was evil. Our, our DNA, if you will, was sin. We did not love the Lord with all our hearts. We did as we pleased. In other words, we were a slave to our sin nature, and there was nothing we could do about that. The Christian, however, has a new nature. God has crucified the old rebellious nature and replaced it with a renewed heart. Consequently, the believer is able to freely live for Christ. We can enjoy our new life in Christ because we have joined him in his death and resurrection. We have unbroken fellowship with God and freedom from sin. Jesus is all you need to truly live. So what do you need to live? You need Jesus. You need Jesus. We are filled and complete in Christ. Jesus enables us to truly live life the way that it's intended to be lived, in freedom and love of God. The next time you are feeling inadequate, or you're believing that you do not have everything that you need to enjoy this life, oh, if I just had the next thing, I want you to prayerfully remember and thank God for the fact that because you belong to Christ, you have all that you need. You lack nothing. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus is all we need to truly live. Let's pray. Father, then we come before you with hearts that are humbled and grateful. You have given us everything we need to truly live life. And I pray, Lord, for each and every one of us that we would not allow the enemy of our souls to tell us otherwise. We wouldn't buy into lies empty philosophies, elemental spirits of this world, hollow and deceitful statements to define who we are or to define how we need to go about living. We'd be able to stand firm, rooted and built up in Christ against those things, knowing that we have all we need because Christ lives in us. And your word is our roadmap. It shows us how to truly live. Lord, may we dwell in those truths we be rooted and established and built up in all of those truths, allowing Christ to have his way in our thoughts, our, our minds, our will, our emotions, our attitudes, our actions, everything about who we are. Because you've given us everything we need to truly live. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have the praise team come up. We're going to close with one last song that celebrates uh, these, these truths. Our Redeemer lives. He lives. And we lack nothing. And so I invite, uh, invite everyone to go ahead. We're going to stand. And, and this, this song is uh, something we can uh, have a little fun with, put our hands together. If you feel so inclined, it's okay to clap and <laughs> raise it or whatever you may do. But we're going to celebrate the fact that our Redeemer lives and we have hope and purpose in life.
He's everything we need to live this life. We lack nothing. And Lord, I pray against the enemy who would try to convince us otherwise. It says, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not beautiful enough. You're not talented enough. You don't have enough money. You don't have whatever it may be. Lord, we pray against that in the name of Jesus. Their lies, lies straight from the pit of hell. We have everything we need in Christ. Jesus is more than enough for all we need to thank truly live. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings on all of you. Uh, we'll see you in Bible communities for next week. Be safe. Be well. You are the